Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Well, I'm the teaching pastor here, and we're going to continue our series today called Free Your Father, which you go, what in the world does that mean? Well, we talked last week about the idea that we all come from a lineage way back to Adam that is that fell short of the glory of God is what the the verse says. It says, God intended us for great things, for glory, but the sin got in the way of that. And we've all fallen short of the glory of God and how we all have to recognize at some point that our parents were sinners, just like we are. And unfortunately, their sin has an effect, had an effect on us. But the great thing that, that Jesus came to do is he came to set us free from that curse of sin that was upon us. So Adam and Eve, it says they they sinned. And one of the reasons that Jesus had to become a man, I'm getting you thinking right out the gate here. Sorry, I shouldn't have jumped into this. But one of the reasons Jesus had to become a man was because he needed to free our lineage from the bondage that came with sin, from the curse that came from sin. And, And one of the names that Jesus had for himself was the son of man. And man, that set the Pharisees off. It was bad enough that he was claiming to be God, But then when he claimed to be God in the form of man, they go, whoa, whoa, God never becomes the form of man. And that was one of the things that was so amazing about Jesus is he became a man. He walked, faced the same challenges, the same suffering, the same things we go through. And he was sinless. And because of him, we're forgiven of our sins. We're set free from the fact we fell short of the glory of God. And now we have the possibility, we actually already in God's eyes are restored to that former glory because of what Jesus did. Not because of anything you did, but because of what Jesus did. And the challenge we have now is walking in the freedom of that. And and here's what's really frustrating about us humans. Freedom is a scary thing for most of us. Oftentimes we're willing to give up our freedom for somebody that promises to protect us, to promises to, to, to keep us from the thing we fear the most. The government says, hey, we'll, we'll protect you. And we say, oh, yes. And they say, just give us a little bit of your freedom so we can protect you. And then we forget that governments are run by flawed, screwed up human beings. The government is people. They have just as much potential to mess things up as we do. And and they may may think they're smarter than us. They may seem smarter than us, but they've got the same problem we do. And even in their best moment, even in a leader's best moment, they have the potential to really mess things up. So our only confidence that we can have is in God. So we look to him for the freedom that he offers us. Well, this week, we're going to talk about freeing your, getting free from the effects of what your father, your grandfather, your mother, your grandmother, the effects of the sin that was in their life, the effects that it had on you. Because the fact is, sin doesn't operate in a bubble. Sin affects everybody around you. It doesn't just affect you. It affects everyone around you. In a very real way, there's certain things that say, well, that's a private sin. I sin sin privately. Nobody knows. It still has an effect on the world around you, on the way you view the world. And what's really fascinating, and this is what kind of the premise for this thing, this this whole series is, is that we're all looking for God in our life. We're all looking at that God-shaped hole within us and we're looking for people to fulfill that. And the first people that promise to fulfill that we see as God. So as a child, you're very helpless. And the first person that cares for you, we immediately begin to see them as God because we know there's something in us that needs God. And what can happen is it, the way we see God is often very much influenced by the, very, the way we see the first authority figures in our lives. And so we're always looking for God to fill something in us. And we try and find other people that will fulfill it. We try and find love that will fulfill it. Our kids will fulfill it. Uh, And that that becomes a God for us. And anytime there's a God set up other than the real God, that becomes an idol and it's always going to disappoint you. So this week, I want to look at the story of a guy named Noah. Everybody knows of Noah, right? What's Noah famous for? The ark. Noah spent a bunch of his life building the ark. But did you know Noah had a second career after the ark? He became a greeter at Walmart. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. That's not true. It's a just joke. But Noah had a second career after the ark. Once the world, you know, he spent all this time basically saving his family. 
Can you imagine what that would be like? You're telling people all along, it's going to go bad. Things are about to go bad. Repent, repent, repent. Come in the ark with me. And they don't. The real bummer is there was nobody to tell I was right afterwards. Anyway, I was like, I was right. Oh, wait, they're all wiped out. Anyway, (laughs) Noah's second career, it says Noah became a man of the soil. He became a farmer. One of the things he planted, he proceeded to plant a vineyard, grapes. And when he drank some of the wine he made from those grapes, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Well, Noah had a little too much to drink. And he's laying there naked and passed out. There's some point at which we all kind of come to realize, you know, it's interesting when you see, read the story of Adam and Eve. It says the first thing they realized when they were sinned, they sinned is that they were naked. And it's interesting here, we see there's this image of Noah all of a sudden being shown as a flawed man through his nakedness. We see, oh, Noah wasn't so perfect as we thought he was. Sure, he built the ark and saved the world, but he had some problems. He hit the bottle a little too hard. And it says he laid uncover inside his tent. Well, Ham, his son, was a father of a, of a group of people called Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. So he walks in, he's like, ha, dad, that old drunk. And he goes back and tells his brothers, hey, check out dad. He's totally drunk and passed out. Here's what happens. Shem and Japheth, the other two brothers, they took a garment, they took a big cloth and laid it across their shoulders. They put it like this and held it like this. And then they walked in backwards to cover their father's naked body. Their faces were turned away so that they would not see their father naked. So Ham, he he just laughs. He says, look at my my father. What a loser he is. Look at it. He said, what a shame he is. But his two brothers, they decided to cover his shame. Now, there's a bunch of symbolism in here, okay, that's way above my pay grade. Uh, like, there's tons of symbolism here that I, I don't understand all of it, what God was trying to communicate. I'm, you learn in layers, right? And I'm learning all right along with you guys. But what, what, what I think a lot of this is saying is, is that if, it, when you see the shame of your parents, when you recognize for the first time, my parents weren't as perfect as I thought I was. In fact, they were really, maybe your dad was downright mean or tyrannical or violent or abusive, and you start to realize it for what it is, you have a decision in that moment. Are you going to go and make fun of them in their their shame and say, look at what a pathetic person they were? Or are you going to say, you know what? I'm going to choose because grace has this image of covering you with like a, a blanket. In fact, there's a story, this crazy story where Jacob, this is bonus material. The first service didn't get this. There's this crazy story where Jacob, he actually gets a blessing from his father by wearing a a skin of an animal over him and and basically tricking his father into a blessing that belonged to his brother because his brother was super hairy. Weird stories in the Bible, they're there, but they mean something. His brother was super hairy. So Jacob actually puts all this this, uh, garment from an animal over him and the father actually thinks it's Esau, his brother, and he gets the blessing. And it's an image of what Jesus does for us. He covers us with his grace so that when we stand before the father, he says, ah, it's my son. It's my son. I'm going to give you the blessing, the blessing we don't deserve. So anyways, there's imagery there. But here's what happens. Noah wakes up from his hangover, his drunken stupor. And he woke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him. And he said, curse be Canaan. That's the son of his son. The lowest of slaves will he be to his brother. Now again, way above my pay grade theologically, but here's what I think this is saying. When we refuse to forgive, to let go of what our parents did and cover their shame, the fact that they had a sin problem just like we do, we carry a heavy burden of a curse on us. And you've met people that are like this. They've just never been able to recover from what their parents did to them. And they carry it around with them and it it taints the way they see the world. It taints the way they see God. And I think what he's saying, what this, this image is saying here is at some point you have to recognize your parents have shame. But in spite of that, you have to choose to do what the 10th command, the 10 commandment says. And it says this, honor your father and your mother. Now, what, here's, you know, there's 10 commandments, right? And the first four have to deal, deal with how you relate to God. The last six have to deal with how you relate to man. And this is the first of the last six. 
It says, if you want things to go well, you know, everything God asks of us is to make us strong and make us confident. And he says, if you want things to go well, you start by honoring your father and mother. And then the days may be long in the land that the Lord has given you. By honoring your father and mother, you actually get to enjoy the blessings of the place you are in. And you meet a lot of people who are living in a really, the best time in history to be alive in terms of the threats to our safety, the threats to our security, those things like that. Like we're, we're doing pretty good here. Nobody woke up this morning worried that you weren't going to have any food, right? If you did, let us know. We'll point you to a place where you can get food. But most of us are being, we're pretty blessed compared to where our ancestors came from. But here's the thing. You can be right in the middle of the blessing. And if you haven't honored your father and mother, you can miss out on the blessing. And you're carrying around that curse, that weight of, oh. So honor just means this. It just means respect. Now, I get it. We go, well, you got to earn my respect. And there's an element of respect that's earned. But you know, there's an element of respect that you just give to people because of who they are and what they've done. And that's an uncomfortable thing because we live in this very, merit, it's called meritocratic world where it's like, well, you got to earn my respect and deserve it. But here's the thing. That's not biblical. In the Bible, there's certain respect that's given to certain people just because they are in a position they're in. In fact, we're supposed to respect the government. Well, I hate that president. You still got to respect the, the office that he's in. And that's uncomfortable because, well, he doesn't deserve it. But, but here's the thing. I, I've heard a lot of people say, well, my dad, I, I'm not going to respect him. He doesn't deserve it. He was basically just a sperm donor. Yeah, okay. Well, here's the thing. Without him, you wouldn't be here today. So if there's nothing else you can start to respect him with, respect him with that. In fact, I came across this. I thought it was interesting. It says, in order to be born, here's what you needed. For you to be here today, here's what had to happen. You needed two parents. Yeah, in spite of medical science, you still need a man and a woman. <laughs> what medical science says today, you still need a man and a woman to make a human. On top of that, you needed four grandparents. You needed eight great-grandparents. 16 second grandparents, 32 third great grandparents. So we're like, I mean, we're talking generations here. It goes to 128 fifth, 256, 512, 1024, 2048 ninth great grandparents. For you to be born today from 12 previous generations, you needed a total sum of 4,094 ancestors for you to be here over the last 400 years. Now, now think about what's happened over the last 400 years. How many struggles did those people face? Some of your ancestors, they were in covered wagons working their way across the plains. Threats from all sorts of the elements, threats from um, animals, wild animals. They had to build the places that many of you are still living on the land today. How many struggles did they have to face? Some of your ancestors were brought here against their will. They were brought maybe as slaves. How many struggles did they face? How many wars did they have to go through? You think about, we've lived in a relatively peaceful time. But a lot of our family members, they had to, I mean, they faced challenge, wars that were very violent and bloody wars. How many difficulties did those who came before you have to go through that you can't even relate to today? How much sadness, how much happiness, how many love stories. Somebody recently gave me a list of my family lineage traced back generations. She spent a lot of time working on it. And um, my grandpa, he was a Cajun. And um, I always, well, he was, he was from Louisiana and we always assumed he was Cajun. His family all spoke French. And uh, the Cajuns were a group of people from uh, Acadia, which is actually in Canada, but the British ran them out and they had to go down to Southern Louisiana and they kind of had to live off the land there. And that's why they'll eat anything. Cajuns will eat anything, but, uh, which makes it for some really good food. But uh, so I grew up eating crawfish and stuff, but I found out actually my family's actually from France. And they came over to France, but one of my great, great grandmothers, she was a slave that her the man she fell in love with actually paid to free her from slavery and then took her to the courthouse and married her. Interesting, huh? What kind of a love is that? Anybody had to find a slave? And no, we don't, we don't even know what that's like. 
That's the things they had to deal with. How many expressions of hope for the future did your ancestors have to undergo for you to exist in this present moment? You know, it's easy to forget how good things are right now when you don't know anything different. I grew up, had two, knew both of my grandfathers. I told you last week about my dad. He was, his mom was married to a raging alcoholic, a drunken man, and she divorced him early on. My last name should have been Barker instead of Malm, but she divorced that man and married another man named Douglas Malm. And uh, I never got to know Mr. Uh, D- Grandpa Malm that well. He would come down and I always kind of compared him to my other grandpa because my other grandpa was my, my dad's, or my mom's dad, excuse me. And uh, man, he was, he was always buying and selling things. He was super generous with money. He was always buying properties and tractors and developing land. And I was just impressed with that grandpa. But my other grandpa, Grandpa Malm on my dad's side, the one that adopted my dad, I always kind of saw him as kind of a bum. Because all he did when he came down was smoke cigars. One time he's like, I want to go to Lukenbach. I'm like, why do you want to go to Lukenbach? Well, there's a song about it. That was kind of the extent of my experience with my grandpa. And the whole time he's smoking cigars. And even when he wasn't smoking, he had one hanging out of his mouth. And I always thought, oh, that grandpa is kind of a, kind of a bum. But at his funeral, we found something out amazing. They did a military burial for him. And we found out that my grandpa won a silver star. He was awarded a silver star in World War II, which is the third highest honor you can get for valor. My grandpa, the bum. Here's what, here's what they had to say about him. Douglas Malm, private first class. It says, the president of the United States of America, authorized by act of Congress, July 9th, 1918, and under the provisions of army regulation, Awards the Silver Star is awarded to Private First Class Douglas D. Mall, Medical Department, United States Army, for gallantry in action against the enemy while serving with the medical detachment. He went and saved people while he was under fire in World War II. My grandpa, the man who the rest of his life worked at a junkyard and smoked cigars, and I thought was nothing special. It says, while serving in France... The bravery, these are all words I was like, whoa, my grandpa? The bravery, self-sacrifice displayed by private first class moms, extraordinary heroism and devotion to duty were in keeping with the highest traditions of military service and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit in the United States Army. This happened when he was 18 or 19 years old. And I always used to kind of judge him for the way he lived his life. But I think, I wonder if maybe after an experience like that, you just go, I just want to find a place where nobody's shooting at me. And he worked this job that looked like a dead-end job. But I didn't know that about him. And I kind of judged him and the way my dad's family ended up because of that. But, but I didn't know that side of him because he never talked about it. Never would talk about it. And you wonder, in your life, what are the challenges your family had to face? What are the things your dad had to face that he never told you about? That affected the way he treated you? What are the things your mom had to face that she never talked to you about? She just carried it within her that affected you. And, and maybe you've been f- angry and bitter at your parents for that. And you just don't know what they went through to get you to where you are today. And this is a huge challenge we face in our country right now, okay? Because here's, here's the danger of where we are right now. This is super frightening to me what I'm seeing. We have a generation right now that has it so easy and good that they don't realize the sacrifices that have been made to get them to where they are today. They don't realize what people had to give up, what it was like back then. And when you've got it good, you don't know what it's like to not have it good. And we've got a whole generation of people that now they look, they, they believe they're super enlightened because they've been educated. And they say, oh, all those things my parents did back then were so evil. I would never have done that. I'm woke. (laughs) This is serious though, but here's the problem with this woke thing. It's very self-righteous because it thinks, it, it makes you think you're better than the people who came before you and you're not. You just have a different context. And the reason things are better for you than it was for them and the things they had struggles to go through is because they sacrificed to get you to where you are today. And it's very ungrateful 
to sit around judging the generations before and saying, we're going to tear down their statue because they weren't as woke and enlightened as us. If I would have lived in that time, I never would have done that because I'm enlightened. I had a kid actually tell me the other day, I'm enlightened. And I said to him, I've never heard an enlightened person have to tell me they're enlightened. (laughs) And here's the thing. The truly enlightened ones are the most humble. They recognize I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. The sacrifices people had to make to get me here today, I don't even understand those sacrifices. I don't even understand what it's like. I grew up with electricity and air conditioning and cars. And it's a very dangerous thing, this new woke thing we have. Listen, there's some pros to it. Okay, some pros are we need to recognize the things that were done wrong in the past, the slavery, wrong thing. Okay, but we also need to recognize what you have here in the U.S. has never been seen in the history of the entire thousands and thousands and thousands of years of the world. Most of the world was run by tyrannical dictators up until the time this country was founded. This is an exceptional, exceptional thing you're living in. And you have got to have gratitude and humility for that. It's very exceptional. And you say, well, everybody should have freedom. They should, but it's not the nature of the world. And it took a lot of sacrifice to get us where we are today. So stop whining and step up and be who you can be to carry on the legacy. I'm ranting. I'm sorry. But listen, this is super important because it's so self-righteous. Christians get accused of being self-righteous. Listen, non-Christians are just as self-righteous when they're woke and enlightened because they're like, I know stuff. I've been educated. You're like, no, you sat through four years of degree. You got $100,000 of debt. You still don't know anything. Now, go out and make the world a better place. But the way you start by making the world a better place is recognizing you have the potential to be just as evil as everybody that came before you because nothing has changed in history apart from Jesus setting you free from the power of sin and death. That's where it starts from. And when you become so like, you know, it's okay. It's good to be, I, you know, I see this guy handed me a card the other day. He, his title was, you know, I won't give you his name, but he said activist. I'm like, activist? That's, that's literally what your title is? Like, what about? Oh, I mean, I'm fighting injustice. Okay. Most unself-aware guy I've ever met. Fighting injustice starts with recognizing, man, but by the grace of God, I would be a really bad person. And thank God he set me free from the power of sin and death. And that's where that, that thing that we talked about last week, we're now the ministers of recol- reconciliation. We're here to tell people you've been set free. But man, be humble because you're standing on the shoulders of giants. You would not be here today apart from some major sacrifices, people trying things that have never in the history of the world been tried before, people giving their lives so that you could have the liberty you have today, which you're willing to give back to the government. A little preaching there, sorry. The freedom that we have here is exceptional. And yes, there's been some injustice in the past, but we also don't understand how far we've come from what could have been and what was. So have a little humility, have a little gratitude, recognize you're standing on the shoulder of giants. And if you see further, it's because you're standing on the shoulders of giants. We're not worried about raiding hordes of people from Northern Asia coming in with clubs and beating us and burning our huts, right? We've got it pretty good. And it's because a lot of people have paid a lot of price to get us to where we are today. So here, here, here's my point for you guys today. There's, we talked last week in Hebrews. There's this list in Hebrews 11 of all these people who lived by faith and did amazing things. And it's, just, it's, it's this powerful line at the end of Hebrews 11. It says, all these guys I just mentioned to you, Abraham, Moses, <coughs> all of them were commended for their faith, for believing, for living a good life, for trusting that God had plans and walking it out. Yet none of them received what had been promised since God planned something better for us that only together with us would they be made perfect. Again, this is one of those things that's way above my pay grade. I don't understand all of it. There's a lot of depth to it. But, 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 but what I believe he's saying is here, you have a role in walking out the freedom that God gave to our world through Jesus Christ. And part of that is freeing your father from the shame of what he did, freeing your mother from the shame of what they did, freeing your ancestors, those who came before you and did some dumb things, let them off the hook because Jesus let you off the hook. Then here's the really cool part. 
So Hebrews 11 actually ends right here. When Paul wrote the book, he didn't put numbers in it. That was later when he wrote the letter, Paul, uh, he, he didn't put like Hebrews 11. Oh, this is a good time to tr- transition to ch- chapter 12. That was scholars that did it later. It was one long stream of consciousness letter Paul wrote. And, and we separated here and we read Hebrews 12 apart from Hebrews 11, but they, they go together. He says, you're called to do this, complete this redeeming work of God in the world today and be a minister of reconciliation, telling the world, you're set free, guys. You're set free. There's forgiveness. Walk in that forgiveness. And so here's the thing. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, since we're standing on the shoulders of giants and so many amazing people have come before us that, yeah, they were flawed, but they created a pretty amazing setup for us right now. Since we have this cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and sin that so easily entangles us. He says, stop getting hung up with the curse of sin. Break free from that. And he says, and let us run with perseverance the race marked before us. And here's how you run that race with perseverance. You fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't fix your eyes on what your parents did, what they didn't do, the family lineage where you came from, the disadvantage you were set at because of the color of your skin or because the economic situation you're in. You don't fix your eyes on that because that doesn't define you. You fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of the faith, because for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. It says he scorned its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who suffered a bunch from sinful men so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. It says some, some of you right here this morning, you need to forgive the shame of your parents, the disadvantage they set you at. You just need to say, I'm letting them go. Just like Noah's kids, recognize what they did, but you cover their shame. Others of you have a heritage of faith. You had a faithful mother, a faithful, uh, a faithful father, and you've been running from that heritage. And let me tell you something, you're never gonna find peace until you get back in line with what God has set up for you. You've been running from it for whatever reason, because your parents were flawed, they followed God, but you're like, well, they were hypocrites. They, followed, they tried to follow God, but they were so mean to me. Well, listen, let it go and step up to the heritage of what, you've, what God has called you to be. Continue the work of your parents. We're going to talk more about that next week. But if you've been running from, from your parents, the, the godly heritage they gave you, even if they were messed up, because everybody's parents are messed up, you need to get back in line because you're never going to fulfill your destiny that God has for you running from it. But we all have a role to play in being ministers of reconciliation and recognizing that God forgave our entire, the whole lineage from Adam all the way up to you. He forgave. And now your message is, I'm going to walk in forgiveness of those who came before me. I'm going to change the course, the destiny of my family. You may have a horrible heritage behind you and you may say, okay, it ends here. That's what my dad had to do all the alcoholism, all the abuse. He's like, it ends with us. It ends with me. And he set the course. He set a new foundation for me. And I'm standing on the shoulders of a giant. And you may be the foundation that needs to be started for your family. You're going to say, okay, it ends here. We're building a new foundation based on Christ. On Christ's solid rock, we will stand. Our family is going to stand right on this. I'm going to break, I'm going to break away from everything, all the shame of our family. And I'm going to stand on this. And I'm going to be the one that sets the course for a new destiny for our family. And that's how you free your father. That's what it's about. That's my prayer for you guys, that you would walk in gratitude. Gratitude for the, what, man, the time of history we're living in. Recognize you have a purpose in this time in history. And and, and most importantly, walk in humility, recognizing Yeah, you know some stuff, but what you don't know is way more important than what you do know. So have some humility because there's a whole lot we don't know. And have some humility that there was a whole lot your parents didn't know that now you know. So you walk out of that knowledge and you forgive those who came before you for their mistakes. And when you walk in that, man, that's the freedom God has for you. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. If you are ever in the Seguin area, Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. 
May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.